Because that's where our destination is, and we praise God for that. Today we're going to conclude, uh, not actually conclude, but today's the, uh, the last part of the series we're doing about uh, becoming a simple church. And uh, today's message is the last one among the four elements, which is focus. So we're going to run through the first uh, three, and then we're going to talk about the last one. So, uh, if you remember, first Sunday of January, we talk about clarity. And um, we, clarity is about defining our clear purpose statement and our process of making disciples. And that is, love God, grow together, reach the world. And then we talk about movement, the second Sunday. Movement is about moving people from worship to, uh, from worship, loving God, to small group growing together, to ministry teams uh, reaching the world. So we talk about moving people to a deeper and a higher level of commitment. I don't know if you still remember, that Sunday I was talking about congestion, right? And mentioned about traffic and being congested um, in your sinus and in your... And right after that I got sick and, and I got congested. And I got my asthma attack, and I got flu. And um, it started right after uh, the prayer and fasting. We went to attend the Pastor's Prayer Summit in, in uh, Tarrytown. The three of us, Pastor AJ, Pastor RJ, and, pa- and me, and myself. And I felt already that I'm getting weak, but I took some medications. But it, it took a toll on me. Uh, it hit me, and until Sunday, I can't get up because I'm running fever I'm chilling, and then uh, um, it's just uh, all the joints of your body is aching, and uh, you just don't know what to do. And um, I experienced being congested once again. You know, the experience of you, you want to breathe easily and freely, but it can't, you can't. Because every time I, I inhale, every time I exhale, I cough. And you know, some of you can experience that I've been through. So uh, mo- movement meaning there's no congestion, there's, no, uh, uh, th- there's nothing that hinders the flow of our growth. Alignment, Pastor AJ talked about alignment la- uh, last Sunday, uh, which I really missed that message, but uh, I, have the, I have the idea of uh, how it went uh, because he shared to me. Uh, alignment is uh, being united in our ministries. And uh, the main thing that I'd like to uh, share with you about alignment briefly is that Uh, in aligning our ministries and our purpose is that we are going to apply our purpose statement and the process of making disciples in every age-specific department or age level in the church. Meaning, our our children will have their theme of loving God, uh, growing together, and reaching the world. Our young people will do the same, loving God, growing together, and reaching the world, and of course, us, a whole church. So, so that's the idea of, of alignment. And then today, we're going to talk about focus. And let's bow our heads as we ask the Lord to bless our time together as we study. Father in heaven, thank you for your word today. Thank you that we can submit to you and listen to your word as we look in the lives of uh, your servants in the Bible. I pray that you will speak to us. I pray that you will continue to uh, make it clear that you have, you have been leading us into this direction where we want to submit to you and we want to reach as, as many lost as we can and, and help them grow in their life spiritually. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, focus. One thing. That's our topic today. Um, focus is a truth that is uh, taught and affirmed throughout Scripture. And the focus of individuals in the Bible, we're going to take a a look at a few of them this morning. Uh, The focus of these individuals in the Bible is very humbling. And the principle of one thing, one thing, um, always emerges. So at the start today, let me ask you, what is your one thing in life? What is that one thing in your life that you so much focus on that it can be anything, but you, at least you have one. At least you have one thing that you focus. It can be your job, it can be your family, it can be your house, your car, whatever it is. Um, you have that one thing that you desire. Um, so some of you who are still 
sing, single and seeking for a life partner, you have that one thing, that focus that you want to you wanna focus all your attention, your own energy, your resources in, in, in that person that you're pursuing in life. But let's look at the life of David first of all. Okay? David, um, in Psalm 27 verse 4, says this. Now before verse 4, if you read uh, verses 1 to 3, he talks about people who are oppressing him, people who are trying to attack him and, and destroy him. But in, in verse 4 of Psalm 27, this is what we see. Uh, David said, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek. And what is that one thing? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's beautiful. That's the one thing in the life of David. One thing was David's focus and that is an intimate and passionate relationship with God. And that consumes him every day of his life. And that is loving God in his life. So when David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord... He was thinking of being in the house of the Lord. He's not thinking of being in heaven right away because he mentioned some other stuff that does not relate to heaven later on in the verse. But he was, he was so desirous to be in the house of the Lord. He's not desiring to be back in the court of King Saul or he's not even desiring to be back at home where his family is or even in his position as a general, as a, as a leader. But he wants to be in the house of the Lord. And then he said, that I will seek after. This talks about prayer. This talks about urgent prayer. This is the desire of his life and his prayer life. Let me tell you, uh, of all the things that we're doing here, without prayer, we're going to fail. So being a simple church will not happen if, we'll not, if we will not pray uh, really, really hard about this. So as we go along, pray for us, pray for, for the church, pray for each one of us. Pray for our worship, our small groups, our ministries, that God will continue to touch hearts. And this is David's desire, to, to pour out his heart to the Lord. And then, and then he said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He longs to be in the place of divine worship. He longs to be in the presence of the Lord. And to dwell there, for David, is, is the greatest happiness. In his life. It's the greatest fulfillment in his life here on earth. Now why do, why do we say that? Now as you notice, David in the following words that he mentioned here, he, he even envied the sparrows, the birds that are nesting on the altar. He says, they are even there day and night. They, they sleep there and I wish I could do that. They, they stay there, and that's his heart's desire. He envied uh, the very sparrows and the swallows that build their nests on the altars. And then he said, one day in the temple of the Lord is better than a thousand elsewhere. Wow, that is a heart of worship. That is a person who has a desire to be in the house of the Lord. And I have this feeling when I was at home last Sunday, I was there and you're here worshiping. And my heart is actually longing to be here because I want to be worshiping with you. And, but I can't. And, and that's exactly what, how David felt. And then, and then he said, to behold the beauty of the Lord or, or the delight and the pleasantness of the Lord. And so in, in David's heart, his one focus in life is to see the splendor of the Lord, to, to stay in the house of the Lord. And one day in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand elsewhere. And then he said, and to inquire in his temple, to seek the face of the Lord, to ask for blessing and guidance, especially on how to go about with his duty as a leader, as a general. And, and he, he needs to have something from the Lord so that he can impart it to his soldiers. And, and his soldiers are looking up to him. So that's, that's the desire, that's the one thing of David in his life. Now let, let's look at another uh, person or servant of the Lord in the Bible. And, and this is very familiar to you. His name is Paul. Paul in, 
in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. There's this one thing. There's Paul's one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul's one thing in life? Paul's one thing in life and his focus is Christ-likeness. You know, growing in Christ. Christ-likeness compelled Apostle Paul to move forward in his spiritual journey. He's not content. He's not satisfied where he is at present. He keeps desiring to grow. So that's why whenever you ask me what is my goal in life, I, my goal in life is to keep knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I will never stop knowing the Lord. I can never know the Lord perfectly. So that is exactly what's in the heart of the Apostle Paul. Now the problem is with, a lot, with, with other believers, with other Christians, they thought that maturity is like a circle. That when you go in the circle, and when you reach the, the starting point, you, you're done. You're, like, you're fully mature, and the Bible says that you are perfect, which is not perfection like God's perfection, but fully mature. But maturity in our Christian life is not reaching the starting point of your Christian life. The day that you accepted the Lord and you set a goal, uh, after 10 years, I will reach finish line and I'm done. No, there's nothing like that in the Bible. Um, Paul, the very person who wrote this, admitted that he had not attained yet. He said, I have not yet apprehended I have not yet arrived in that level where I can say, I'm going to stop growing. So these, these other believers thought that, and then they defined maturity as though uh, life had reached its final course once and for all. And this is wrong teaching. And this teaching and this belief and this conception will, will lead to uh, complacency and you will relax and before you know it you're down because your guard is, are down so what is knowing Christ what is Paul's desire of knowing Christ it's it's following the Lord it's discipleship so our growing together our discipleship doesn't end after you finish the book that you study discipleship is a lifelong process discipleship is a lifelong commitment it doesn't really matter how, how, how long ago have you met, you can always catch up and meet your disciples or your small group or the people that you are trying to, to help in their maturity. And that's exactly what we're doing here at ICF. Uh, it's an ongoing process. And just a thought for me, maybe I'm thinking, even if I'll be in the presence of Jesus, I'm still going to desire to know him more. Because that's what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to know Him more. We're going we're gonna to just sit there and, re and, and, and worship Him and, and get to know Him. So according to the Apostle Paul, as many as be mature or perfect, have the vision of a faraway goal. So that's so different with uh, the concepts, right? Christian maturity, according to the Apostle Paul, is that stage of life in one's life that the person realizes his most need of perfection. 